We're an island nation, drawn to the sea that surrounds us. A playground for some. For others, it's where they make their living. But the sea's unpredictable. It's Mother Nature, it's a beast. There to save our lives is a volunteer army of over 5,000 ordinary people. Cheers, mate. Ready to leave their jobs, their families, and race to our rescue. When the Pedro goes, it's that adrenaline rush every single time. You could make the difference between life and death. I feel very lucky. Then bringing me back to life again was a miracle. OK. Equipped with their own cameras. Just the two of you. Come on, yes. The crews give us a unique insight into every call-out. Nice deep breaths, OK? All right. As only they see it. The ambulance is here, OK? For those who risk their lives, yeah. it has become a way of life. Come on! You have to do your best because somebody's family are relying on you to save them. Lying on the South Devon coast is the port city of Plymouth. Plymouth's got quite a rich and varied history. It's a fantastic natural port. The Mayflower Steps down on the Barbican are supposedly where the pilgrims boarded their ship to set off for that first voyage to America just over 400 years ago now. So they're quite an iconic um, bit of Plymouth's history. As well as being the original gateway to the New World, Plymouth was also the saviour of Old England as this was where Sir Francis Drake played bowls before sailing out to defeat the Spanish Armada in 1588. Francis Drake's had quite an impression on the city of Plymouth. Drake's Boulevard is a large bit of the city centre that runs down from the train station all the way to the seafront, um, supposedly where he then played bowls on Plymouth Hoe. With so much history crammed into one place, Plymouth attracts five million visitors annually to see the sights set sail from these same historic docks and occasionally need rescuing. There's been a lifeboat in Plymouth um, since the early 1800s, so almost 200 years. Our lifeboat station is a very quirky little 50 pence shaped building. It's part of the old customs house where the old ships used to come in onto Mill Bay Pier. Plymouth lifeboat station also has a notable historical feature of its own. Some of the crew are convinced that there's a, a ghost called George that kind of sits in the station. There's stories of boots moving, doors opening and closing, noises in the night, all that sort of thing. So we were literally here having a crew meeting, and uh, this picture here fell off, just completely off the wall, and then all the doors in the building, they all closed at once, and uh, it's not often that I will come into the building anymore in the dark. If I'm first here when the pager goes off, I'll, like, I'll open the door, put the lights on, but I'll wait until somebody else comes as well. I'm yet to have witnessed this ghost, and I just, I, I think it's just one of our crew members being a little bit scared of the dark. Whether George is genuine or not, the natural dangers around Plymouth are very real. Coastline around Plymouth is rugged, very varied. We've got bits that are kind of sloping right down to the water's edge, and then we've got bits that are just sheer cliffs and, and a long drop. There's quite a big tidal range, so it's ever changing. It's always a different picture depending on what the tide's doing. You're never truly sure what you're going to get until you're out there experiencing it. End of March, late afternoon. A bright but chilly spring day. It was a nice day. Sun was out. I was sat at my desk, kind of coming towards the end of the day, uh, just, just finishing up a couple of jobs. <laughs> The information we were told was there was a vessel that had sunk um, in Whitsun Bay area with one person on board not wearing a life jacket and Mayday relay had been sent out to any vessels in the area. So a Mayday is a distress call, which essentially means there's an imminent threat to life. Um, so it's the highest level of distress. With every second potentially meaning the difference between life and death, the crew prepared to launch their fastest boat, the B-Class. But at Plymouth, even a fast launch takes time. I think we've got one of the longest runs from the station to the boat. 
most stations they're pretty fortunate to have the boat right next to the station whereas for us you're probably talking a 250 meter run into the marina around the pontoon before you get to the ILB. Cheers mate. Let's get a date and position in please. Despite going flat out, it takes the crew almost 10 minutes from call to launch. Are we all sitting down? It was definitely the feeling that the boat wouldn't go fast enough. It's one you don't get on every job, um, but for that sort of job, you, you need every every bit of speed you can get. Well, the Coast Guard, Philip, I'll be good. The Coast Guard scrambles a helicopter, and the all-weather lifeboat also launches and begins the six-mile journey west to Whitsand Bay to assist in a search and rescue. If you're in the water without a life jacket, you're going to be lucky to get your ears potentially most of your face out of the water and if you're trying to spot that from 50 meters away um, it is like trying to spot a needle in a haystack. In Whitsand Bay there's a red Port Ham Martin boy which marks one of the wrecks out there um, and the only information we have is he was to the left of that um, which to be honest means nothing to us uh, other than he can see the boy. It takes the B-class almost 10 minutes to reach Whitsand Bay. And as the crew round the headland, they immediately begin their search. Oh no, that's the map. Boy's there. As we came around the Ramehead area and kind of approaching the coordinates the Coast Guard had given us um, for where the, the last kind of uh, casualty position was, um, we saw a fishing vessel. Whenever a May Day goes out, all local vessels receive it. As the fishing boat was closest to location, it has already located the casualty. So the fisherman was in the process of recovering him as we came alongside. It straight away triggered two thoughts. Firstly, this guy is really lucky. And second of all, when he was getting dragged onto the boat, you could see that this individual was pretty limp. Scotty, do you want to go on board? I jumped on board immediately to kind of make an initial assessment um, and see how the guy was. Um, and that initial assessment was going to dictate all of our decision making from, from then on. I made a famous Plymouth ILB and now I'm seen. I've got crew members on board. He was breathing heavily. He'd been working hard. He said he'd been in the water for about 25 minutes, and in that time you can get really, really cold in eight or nine degree water. So obviously we were we were very concerned um, about how cold he would have got in 25 minutes in the water, uh, but also very impressed that he'd been treading water for 25 minutes in full clothing. A Falmouth Coast Guard, Plymouth ILB. Yeah, we're now on scene, just an update on the coastie. Uh, it is extremely cold, uh, but uh, otherwise unhurt. But they are extremely drowsy. Worried that the casualties' condition could deteriorate, Cameron radios the Coast Guard to find out how close the helicopter is for a possible extraction. A lot of the time, people put a huge amount of energy into surviving in that situation, which means as soon as they think they're safe, all of that energy and the effort that their body's making goes. Um, so people can actually go downhill quite quickly. We were also worried about the secondary drowning, um, whether we swallowed any water, which is a real concern because it's not immediately apparent, um, but it can be a really, really dangerous condition that can develop um, hours after somebody's been in the water. If I'm reading that right, that's uh, approximately a 30 minute ETA, by which time we will be back uh, at Mill Bay. I think if you're happy, uh, we'll extract the casualty by boat and uh, take to Mill Bay uh, rather than wait the aircraft over. As the helicopter is still half an hour away and the crew are eager to get the casualty ashore quickly to receive proper medical attention, they decide to take him in the lifeboat. Yeah, Falmouth, with Plymouth RB, that's all copied. I think we are happy to stand the aircraft down totally with that ETA. Uh, he is uh, just cold, uh, but if you can keep the ambulance rolling, uh, that would be appreciated of it. The guy was relieved once he was on board, and from that point on, it was just making sure that he doesn't drop in body temperature and he, he gets wrapped up nice and warm. Come on, hands up, mate. Come on. 
We're not trying to suffocate you. We just want to make you look as good in orange as we do. As soon as we got the foil blankets on him and the wind protectors and all that sort of stuff, he, uh, he was starting to engage in conversation much more fluidly. You're all right. Yeah. You look all right, I'm and you great. look a hell of a lot better now you're out of the water. Yeah, I, I, but, um, I'm so happy that you guys found me. I've got with lifeboat. Crew numbers are as follows. The fact that he didn't go quiet and sit there and he was able to have a logical conversation with us, it meant that we were pretty confident that he was going to be fine and just needed a little bit more care. So, actually, in a minute, yeah. we're going to transfer you onto the big boat because they got the heaters and the fluffy blankets. Yeah, so, nice. just get, try and get your arms out of those blankets. The crew head over to the all weather boat, so the casualty, Ashley, will have a much warmer, smoother ride back to the station. I've never felt that cold. I, I was so cold. Um, I, I can't even comprehend how cold I felt. Um, I couldn't even equate it to anything else. Ashley had set out earlier from Plymouth on his boat, Jakey, for an afternoon of fishing. I had visions of catching flatfish and started to drop down a few lines. Nothing really was taken there. So I got to a stage where I thought, right, it's time to go home. So I go to the front of the boat to pull the anchor and I could not get it up. Don't know what was going on. So I thought, what I'll try and do is I'll try and start the engine and pull it up, use the power of the engine. This didn't go according to plan. The rope which the boy was attached to somehow got into the propeller. The boat then turned. Then the waves started coming into the boat one after the other and it was literally about two waves filled the boat and I was up to my knees um, in seawater and it was just so quick. In just a few minutes, Ashley's boat sank from beneath him, leaving him alone in the ocean a mile from shore. All I could think about was, I'm in so much trouble when I get home. <laughs> so um, yeah, that just kept me going. I wanted to get home to my wife and, uh, and my children. My biggest fear was leaving my children without their dad and my wife about her husband. That was my biggest fear. And um, nothing mattered other than that. And then I just started swimming. It's treading water, swimming. My adrenaline just kept me going. And then I, I remembered I had my phone in my pocket. I thought it won't work. You know, I'm out of sea, it's stoked. Pulled it out and it lit up. Couldn't believe it, it lit up. But obviously it was wet, the screen was wet. My hands were drenched. I was trying to open it, wouldn't do it. So I started hitting everything. Um, there's an emergency thing on your phone where once you press all the buttons, it will do an emergency call, which is what it did. Um, it went through and it called my wife. But it went to voicemail. So my heart completely sank. Um, I thought that this was my lifeline. And then it, it didn't. Didn't, it didn't go through. So I left a voicemail <clears throat> telling my wife that obviously I loved her. Um, I'd mucked up big time and um, I'm really sorry. Um, and that if she got the call, to call the Coast Guard. Because um, I don't think at this point I had any. Uh... Sorry. I didn't think at this point um, I was going to get through. I had a feeling it was my only call. I'd thought the phone was going to die. It was wet. I didn't think it was going to last. When I hung up the call, my phone unlocked. It's like my prayers were answered in a way. Um, I dialed 999. And I managed to get through to the Coast Guard. I was on the phone to him in total for 25 minutes. Treading water, phone in the air because I didn't want it to die. And then I saw a fisherman. So I just screamed, shouted, waved. And he saw me. I was so happy. I was so ecstatic that they were there. I was so happy that I got out of it. I don't know how I got out of it, but I did. The all-weather boat returned to the lifeboat station, where an ambulance and paramedics were waiting, along with one other concerned party. Got the two paramedics across. The casualty was improving minute by minute. 
Um, I then had a phone call saying his wife was at the front gates. That was amazing. She, she wandered on the boat and I was so happy to see her. But she was so cross with me at the same time. She was elated to see me, but you could tell she was so cross. <laughs> it, was, it was a good feeling, though. It was just a huge sense of relief seeing his wife go through the wheelhouse door and him standing up and throwing his arms around her. I think seeing loved ones, it's not something we often see, but it kind of makes it human again. You know, when, when you're out on the boat, you're, you're following your training and the, the operant procedures and all that sort of stuff, and you're kind of in autopilot a little bit. Um, but it kind of brings it all home that actually this is, this is somebody and somebody's family. After the shout, I felt pretty happy. It's probably just the word to describe it, the fact that that day a uh, life was saved. A uh, huge credit goes to the, the fishing vessel that was on scene. But you, we all knew that we could genuinely walk away from that day knowing that it was a job well done. The whole reality of what I'd been through didn't hit me until I got in the ambulance. I just couldn't believe I was just there in an ambulance, whereas half an hour before I was treading the water and <laughs> fighting for my life. I think that rescuing someone in that situation, it's not just them that would have been impacted. There's, you know, there's a whole family and, and group of people behind it. So yeah, it, it's, it's nice to feel like it's a contribution to more than just one person's life. My family kept me fighting. The thought of my family was the only thing keeping me going. Um, yeah, I, I, I had to get home. So that kept me fighting. Whenever the pages sound, every single one of the RNLI's 5,600 seagoing crew members experience exactly the same thing. Every time, whether it's when the pager goes off, when you're getting on the boat, when you're going to a scene, or when you're on scene, the heart rate is through the roof, uncontrollable, and you just kind of have to pace yourself. No matter how many times it's happened, it's that same, that adrenaline rush every single time. You never really go over it. Any lifeboat person that says they don't get that adrenaline rush, they gotta be lying. <laughs> they got to be. Hold on! I still get that, you know, my heart flutters a bit. You want to get there, you want to help them as much as you can. You okay? The adrenaline rush will never go away. Come on, quickly! Get up! And I think the day it goes away is it's time to step down. In the far north of the British Isles lies the ancient harbour town and official royal borough of Wick. Wick's a small town. Uh, it has a population around about 8,000. It's pretty much built in the fishing industry, herring uh, predominantly. It was one of the largest herring ports in Europe. In Wick's heyday, it was uh, a really, really busy port. Uh, the harbour was chock a block with fishing vessels you could have had a thousand fishing boats in the harbour. It was actually an old tale that you could walk across from one side of the harbour to the other uh, just by stepping over all the different boats. And the quay just filled with barrels of herring and uh, all the solid ladies down salting the herring and prepping it. Though decades of overfishing in UK waters have seen the herring fleet disappear from the harbour, Wick does continue to profit from its proximity to the sea. The harbour is still a fishing port. There's a mix of commercial operations and work boats. There's an offshore wind farm just 10 miles off the coast. Operated and maintained out of Wick Harbour, the Beatrice Wind Farm has 84 turbines, generating enough electricity to power 450,000 homes. Also operating out of the harbour, as it has done since 1848, is Wick Lifeboat Station. We have quite a varied range of shouts. A lot of them are missing persons. We also have, obviously, breakdowns, boats losing power or being towed back in, people getting cut off from the rocks. The coastline around Wick, we've got sheer cliffs, sea caves, a headland that sticks out into the sea. It can be quite a, quite a fearsome bit of water. It takes quite a battering, it really takes a hit. And if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, it's, it's not good. This year is Wick 
Lifeboat Station's 175th anniversary. So there's 175 years of hard graft that's gone on before us and, and we're just another small step in that, you know, carrying it on. Late February, early evening, a call comes in to the Coast Guard, reporting a man stranded on a reef by the rapidly rising tide. When someone's cut off by the tide, what passes through your mind is, you know, the degree of urgency. You know, are they imminent to enter the water? We didn't know if the person was safe, high and dry, or at risk of getting in the water. So I was quite concerned. The crew quickly launch and leave the lights of the harbour behind as they begin the four-mile journey to location across increasingly lively seas in near total darkness. It's quite difficult from driving through the town, street lights on, bright lights, into the station, and all of a sudden you're plunged into uh, darkness and it takes time for your, your eyes to acclimatise. To prepare the crew for the search, the cabin lights are switched to red to help their night vision. And did you get a description? Oh, so it's a six-year-old male, he's about six foot, grey hair, grey beard. He's a photographer, so he's more than likely to have photographer stuff with him. OK. It takes the crew just under 15 minutes to reach Sandigo, an old lighthouse landing stage, where the casualty has now been stranded for almost half an hour. As we arrived, we were straight into search mode, so we were using searchlights, we were using the night vision, and we were also using thermal imaging to look for this person. We're looking for anything. Somebody waving, somebody shining a torch, and uh, we, we actually saw torchlight. I've got a heat source there, and it looks like they're high up out the rocks. Yeah, that's him. He's got a head torch on, he's waving at us, and they've got him on the phone, and they confirmed that they could see us. Over. Luckily, on such a dark night, the casualty has managed to maintain phone contact with the Coast Guard. At their request, he's now shining his torch for the crew to see. The, the casualty was on, uh, on top of a, a large rock. So he was properly cut off. He was in a fair bit of danger. We obviously knew exactly where we had to go, um, but we couldn't just make a beeline for him. There's quite a lot of rocks that stick out. Though the rising tide has cut the casualty off from the shore and is threatening to wash him off at any moment, there isn't enough water for the lifeboat to reach him over the now submerged rocks. The all-weather lifeboat is an immense bit of kit. It will go anywhere and do anything um, apart from in shallow areas. So if we know we need to go into rocky coastline or it's too shallow for the lifeboat, we carry the daughter craft, the XP dinghy, for that. And this is one of those occasions it was needed. Jack and Neil are chosen to crew the XP boat and attempt to rescue the stranded photographer. The level of responsibility that you feel there is, it's huge. You're putting two people that you know well. Um, you, you're putting them in a small craft away from the lifeboat, so a relative place of safety to somewhere that's maybe not quite as safe. Right. If it's at all dodgy, the options are helicopter or rope rescue, so yeah. don't feel like you have to do it. You know? No, 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 that's right. There's always a certain degree of nervous, nervousness um, when you're going in that boat. It is effectively just a little dinghy. It's got quite a limited weather capability. Yeah. With only a five horsepower engine, the XP launches into the swell, with Jack at the helm and Neil on the bow, keeping a sharp lookout. There's rocks here, Jack, so go above them. Yeah. Now, slow down, Jack, you can't hear now. There was a good bit of sea running, obviously. You could quite easily get swept with a, a wave and onto rocks. See, it's breaking there, you see now? This might not be quite as straightforward as we think, Jack. The distance to the rocks is just a few hundred metres, but in near total darkness and with rocks just below the surface, it's a challenging journey. In the dark, you have to be on your toes. You need to uh, have, have a lot of situational awareness. As we started to approach into shore, the swell kind of got a bit worse. There was rocks on the surface. 
if you get a wave that lifts you up and sets you on top of it, could puncture a boat, and you'd obviously be stuck as well then. Just watch us here, Jack. In the dark and in constantly shifting seas, the only way to spot submerged rocks is when the waves break over them. That's breaking there as well, Jack, you see? It's breaking there, you see that? We thought we'd try uh, to edge a boat up on the rocks so that Neil could then jump on. You've got rocks here, Jack, yeah? Looks like a bit of a shallow here. In there? Yeah. The trick to doing that is you have to be in position, ready to go. And obviously, as one wave comes in, as soon as you see it kind of pass, you have to kind of get in and get them off, and then obviously get out of there as soon as possible. Yeah. Just put a bit. I just keep hold her in, Jack. Yeah. Hold her in. Yeah. <sighs> yep. 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 Go back off. Yeah, go back off. With the restless sea and hidden rocks threatening to puncture the XP boat at any moment, Jack pulls back into deeper water, leaving Neil to make his way across to the casualty. Hello, how you doing? Uh, oh, I don't worry about that. That's that's the least of your problems, buddy. First impression was he he looked safe. Are you injured at all? No, no, I'm. I'm quite sure. You're not overly cold or anything? No, no. Good. Careful, careful. Having established that the casualty, Andy, is not hurt or suffering from exposure, Neil leads him to the water's edge, ready for extraction. We'll just wait, see what, what the sea does here. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. it's a bit of choppy in bits. Jack came in with the XB boat. The only bit as possible is going to be probably here. But there's a fair bit of movement of water, Jack. There was a bit of swell, so we were just trying to get the right moment so we could transfer them without too much movement in the XP boat because the, the tide was beginning to lift. So the bow's going to have to sit about there, Jack. You see where Lake is? Oh. oh, you're going to get grounded here, Jack. Uh, yeah, right, Andy, go in there. Yeah. Transferring the casualty to the boat is the most dangerous part of the rescue, with each new wave threatening to toss him into the water. It's always going through the back of your mind, you know, if a wave comes in now, things move, it could go a bit pear-shaped. Step in and hang on. With the casualty and his gear on board, the XP is close to capacity. So, so, very further back, Andy. so Neil decides to help the boat get away from the rocks and jump back aboard on a second run. Are you in? It was quite shallow. At one stage, the prop had, had caught something under the water. Hang on. It wouldn't have been good if we'd lost the engine. Um, yeah, we would have probably ended up on the, on the shore ourselves, helpless. Neil waits for the next rising wave to give the propeller enough water to grab onto. Yeah, it's OK. Next wave, Jack. Next wave. Then shoves the XP boat away from the rock. Right, Jack. I'll stay here. Jack took the casualty back out to the all-weather lifeboat and uh, we landed him aboard, got him into the warmth of the wheelhouse, made sure he was safe. Jack then had to return to the rock to pick up Neil. In the time it's taken Jack to deliver the casualty to the ALB, the tide has risen further and the waves have grown larger, making the extraction of Neil even more of a challenge. It's getting a bit lively, Jack! When Jack came back to get me, there was a lot of motion in the sea, um, and it was it was going to be a bit of a challenge getting back onto the boat. Probably in here is as good as anywhere. I think we'll have one shot at this. The motion of the waves, the boat kept moving back, forwards, sideways. <clears throat> Whoa! It was the way that I got on board with a jump, basically. Got Neil on board and then obviously navigated away out from my shoreline and started heading back towards a lifeboat. By the time they reached the all-weather boat, the rock Andy had been stranded on was rapidly diminishing beneath the waves, leaving him reflecting on a quest for a sunset shot that almost ended in tragedy. I felt very foolish. 
and very stupid that I got myself into that position. It was a beautiful afternoon and I decided to grab my camera, go off out and take some photos somewhere very local because I only had maybe two hours of light. That's great, we get soft light, we get nice sunsets. Sandigo has a reef of rock that goes out maybe 25 yards. And that was where I ended up going to take the profile shot of the sea stack. So I went further out onto the reef that made a nice composition. Sadly, I never got any nice sunshine on the cliff, but I was happy and I'd enjoyed my day. Andy packed his bags and headed back to shore, only to discover that he'd misread his tide app. Instead of going out, it had risen and he was now cut off. In my rush, I'd mistakenly gone out at low tide instead of high tide. At that point, I realised, oh, I only had one option and would have to call 999 and ask for the Coast Guard. I just felt like a complete idiot that there I was sitting on a rock waiting on some form of help. When I saw the lifeboat, I felt very relieved that I was going to get off the rock and quite quickly be back home in the town. I think in this circumstance, things could have went badly wrong. Thankfully, this chap was prepared and he had phone and he was able to show us where he was. But without that, things could have been even disastrous. With the swell there, that would be enough just to take somebody off their feet and you, you may not come back from that. I'm exceedingly grateful for everyone that was involved. They put themselves out there they're a thought for themselves and I'll, I'll always be thankful for what they did. We did ask the casualty if he'd managed to get a good sunset photo and unfortunately he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Over 300 miles south, in the county of Denbyshire, is Wales' largest seaside resort, Llandudno. Llandudno is a traditional Victorian town. It has lots of history, gorgeous beaches, rugged cliffs and beautiful mountains. Plundin on a lovely sunny day, if I look at the sea, and it's like it's still, it's like a mill pond, and the sun's coming up, and it's just, it's just like the Mediterranean. Maybe a few degrees cooler. Land or no, can be unpredictable with the weather. You know, one day it could be raining, and you can hardly see a soul. The next day, sun shining, there's kayaks out, there's paddle borders, there's people swimming, so it gets real busy in this town. As with any seaside resort, lots of people means lots of potential for getting into trouble. There's been a lifeboat coming to the rescue here since 1861. Put your arm through and then bring it down the back. There we go. As well as saving lives at sea, the Clandudno crew also try and prevent accidents happening in the first place in this family-friendly resort through education. We do water safety because I think that is really important that we engage with young children. So this kit is really, really important. And this helps me stay afloat in the water. And it's just making them aware of the dangers. It could be a riptide, it could be, you know, making sure you use your life jackets. So he's in the life ring now, this is keeping him afloat. Generally, the kids respond amazingly well. They want to get engaged, they, they love the fact that we've got all these things to play with. Hand up! What do we shout? Oh, I can't hear you! Yeah. Help! Help! If we can just get through to just one child, that's enough to make a difference. Mid-July, a gloriously sunny Monday evening. Monday nights are our exercise evenings, and we'd launched the all-weather lifeboat on an exercise, and we were just in the process of recovery. <laughs> 
then we heard the alarm go and we heard the shout, kayak is in the water. A person in the water calls for an immediate launch. With the all-weather lifeboat on the beach and requiring recovery, the crew dash for the D-Class. We've legged it up the beach, um, got changed into our inshore lifeboat kit, and we can quickly get kitted up and, and go straight out. OK. The casualties, a father and son, have been reported in the water off the Little Orr, a headland on the eastern end of Llandudno Bay, about a mile from the station. The initial information we received was that there were four kayaks um, with two casualties in the water. Um, my main concern was how long those casualties had been in the water. Even in July, sea temperatures here average around just 15 degrees. Prolonged exposure can prove fatal. There's still a risk of hypothermia and potentially drowning. We don't know whether that casualty is wearing a life jacket or not. Every second counts. We need to get to those casualties. The conditions on that day were fair. The issue really was that the tide was taking them out. We need to try and locate them as quickly as possible because we don't want it to turn into a nighttime search because that makes it so much more difficult to find the casualty. With the sun due to set in just over an hour, the pressure is on to find and rescue the casualties while there's still light. Visual! When we rounded the headland, we could see two separate groups. Yeah, got it! Hot boy! Yeah, got it! What I could see initially were possibly two kayakers further out um, and then a group of four closer inshore. So, given the information I had, I've initially gone towards the group of four. They're all in. What about them over there? Let's go and speak to these four first. It's waving over there. But waving over there. And then it was at that point we saw the other party um, sticking their paddles up in the air. So it was apparent that they, that they were the group that we needed to head towards. When we first arrived on scene, we could clearly see there was a cluster of kayaks. One casualty was lay across the kayaks in a, a survivor's blanket and we also had a casualty in the water. On the scene of a casualty, right, over. On the other side, one in the yeah. water, yeah. One in the water that side, okay. this one's colder. Yeah. The crew arrived to discover one casualty already recovered and lying across two kayaks. The other is still in the water. There you go, mate. Yeah, turn round, actually. Turn round. Yeah. OK, yeah. right. one, two, three. Yeah. OK, mate. You all right, yeah? Yeah. He was cold, he was, um, he was shivering. So we checked the casualty, made sure he didn't have any injuries before moving on to the second casualty. Basically, we'll come back and try and get this. Yeah, this guy's been shivering. Okay. Yeah, do you want to... Yeah, you want to scoot across? He stopped yeah. shivering a little bit. Yeah, let's get you over. With the second casualty, we were a bit more concerned as he was lying face down across the kayaks and it was difficult to talk to him. He was quiet and he looked very cold. I think because he didn't have anything other than a shirt and shorts on. Sam, lift your feet up. Just bend your knees. Get your knees up, mate. That's it. Have they swallowed water or are they just... Uh, no, just not as far as we know. There was no easy way of bringing the younger casualty on board. Um, he was lay across two kayaks. We had to kind of scramble him across, uh, pull the aisle be up to the side and basically pull him in. Right. Sam, you're going to wriggle back. Can you just, you're doing like a backwards crook. Jimmy, come on, come on, come on, go on, go on, mate, go on, we've got you. You're there. You're there, buddy, well done. Got you, mate. OK, so get that, spot up, get your arm up. He seemed quite shaken up, and it looks kind of like hypothermia could be could be kicking in, so uh, it was really important to us to get him warm. Got to try to keep you warm, yeah? Well, that red one, yeah. OK. So once we got both casualties on board, it was important then to uh, get the survival blankets out to keep them warm, get them back as quickly as possible. Just pop that round there, mate. Okay. Put your hands in there as well, yeah? As crew, you can identify um, when a casualty is a bit shaken up. Uh, you try and take the mind off things. Uh, you talk to them. They both seemed 
pretty shaken up and really cold. OK, well, what we'll do is we'll get you into the station, get you warmed up a bit and see if you need any other medical attention. So it's really important that we keep talking to casualties because that's one way that we make sure that they remain conscious. Uh, what we don't want is an unconscious casualty. So we need to turn it back? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and just what, it just, just rocked it. Oh, okay. First time we've taken it out, though, is it? Yeah. That's what we're in for, anyway. It's funny how things can change so quickly. We've gone from this really perfect time to suddenly we're in the water. Dave had set out earlier with his son, Sam, on their new kayak's maiden voyage. Plan um, for the evening was for me and my dad to go take our kayak out. It would be our first venture out in our new kayak, and we were going to meet up with our, our friends who were already out there. It was something nice to do with my son. We could see other people on the sea, and it was really calm, gentle waves lapping the shore. So, yeah, it felt like a, a good time to try kayaking. We spent a couple hours on the water. We were with our friends. They were fishing. We saw a lot of birds, we saw caves, we saw seals. It was a really beautiful experience. It felt like we'd been out in the water for maybe a couple of hours kayaking. Um, so Sam and I were ready to, to head back. Uh, our friends wanted to carry on fishing. And it was on that way back that I noticed that water was coming in quite a lot and quite deep. So I said to Sam, Sam, I think we've got a problem. Um, there's water coming into the kayak. I was kind of like, don't be ridiculous. Let's just get to the shore. And then I suddenly started noticing it was getting heavier, harder to paddle. The kayak was tilting more. And then before we knew it, we were in the water and the kayak was upside down. At this point, Sam and I are trying to get the attention of our friends who weren't too far away, but they couldn't hear us shouting, but they could see us waving. And I think they could see that we were in the water, so they came as quickly as they could over to our aid. At this point, we've probably been in the water for maybe 25, 30 minutes. I've got my life jacket on, but there's nothing protecting me from the cold, so it was starting to get a bit cold. I went prepared with my wetsuit. My son being 18, didn't really feel the need for a wetsuit. He wasn't planning on getting wet, um, so he didn't have one. You want a hand getting that back in in a minute? There happened to be two kayak instructors who were with a group um, along the same bit of beach. One of the kayak instructors looked at me and said, you know, we need to get you out of the water because you're going blue and you're shivering. The instructors pulled Sam from the water and lay him across their two kayaks as they waited for the lifeboat to arrive. And then the lifeboat turned up, so I was quite glad to see them. At that point, I thought, well, yeah, this is over now, we're safe. Um, so that was a real relief. Less than 10 minutes after being rescued, Dave and Sam were dropped off at the beach by the lifeboat station. OK, how are you get? To me, Chris. When we've got back to the beach, we've handed the casualties over to the shore crew um, that were still in the process of recovering the all-weather lifeboat. There you go, Sam. And they've taken them up to the lifeboat station. At the station, Dave and Sam used the hot crew showers to warm themselves back up before heading home. I had uh, a little bit of a lump in my throat because obviously I take my son uh, kayaking around the Little Orm in the same location. We go fishing and, uh, yeah, to see a father and son hitch problems like that is, is, yeah, is quite hit home. I think without the assistance of the other kayakers, the situation would have been very different. I think if they'd been in the water for longer, then the chances of hypothermia setting in would have been greatly increased. They've assisted in basically saving those two lives. As the times and days go by, you realise what could have happened, and it, you know, it's not a nice thought, is it? I'm really grateful for what they've done. Obviously, they saved our lives. Next time I go in the kayak, I'll definitely be wearing a wetsuit. That was definitely an experience that I learned from this time, and hopefully it would keep me from being so cold.
After a shout, it's always nice to get back on land. You can then debrief, talk about everything, go home, and then your adrenaline's that pumped up. You're, you're ready for the next shout, really. 300 miles north as the crow flies on the Aberdeenshire coast is Fraserburgh, one of Scotland's largest fishing ports. Fraserburgh, or the Broch, as it's kind as locally, is a, a fishing community, quite a vibrant tune. You catch haddock, cod, ling, monk, limonsoul, mackerel, blue white hen, herring. Fishing is a dangerous job. I did it for 10, 11 years. I've been knocked out, I've been broken ribs, uh, I've been overboard, I've seen crewmen get washed overboard and be pulled back on board, I've seen close bars that have been lost at the sea. Facing directly out into the fish-rich waters of the North Sea, Fraserburgh is also in the direct firing line of the North Sea's weather. When it can have westerly wind, and you can be into a full force day and force of living, and seven, eight metre seas, and then as it starts to come around into the northeast, that hail corner that we sit on is just completely blitzed. The North Sea, I mean, one day it can be a really nice day, flat calm, and the next day, you know, you're looking at seas at the height of your house. Tied to the sea by centuries of fishing, the Brock also has a long history of lifeboating. There's been records of lifeboats working out of Brock since 1806, so we've got quite a long history. The first boat was funded by the harbour. They used to charge sixpence a head, and every sailor that came into the port, that would be the toll, and that went towards supporting the harbour lifeboat. The harbour lifeboat was replaced in 1858, when the RNLI established its first lifeboat station in Scotland one still in operation today. We have a Trent-class lifeboat. She's 21 years old this year, a cracking boat. The lifeboat can travel 100 miles out to sea. It's uh, quite a big area to travel. When the page goes off, you don't know what you're going down to, but your adrenaline's buzzing. So really, you're just prepared to do anything for whatever we need to do, really. End of June. A dull and overcast summer's day. An emergency call comes in that a small fishing boat has lost power on the east side of Rosehearty Harbour. <coughs> as we was getting changed and went down to the boat, we noticed that the tide was coming as well, so it was quite an immediate panic, really, to get them as soon as before the tide was started coming into them. The crew launched quickly. And as they start the five-mile journey west to location, more information comes over the radio. We've got an update for the Coast Guard that the vessel had actually run aground. It was on the rocks, and the casualty, the, the owner was now in the water. So that changed the hail dynamic, and the car looked quite a bit. Okay, boys, the situation has changed. Yes, and the dry suit. Dry suit. It just gets your adrenaline pumping even more, you know. It's just, you know, it... You need to be quick, you need to get there as soon as possible and get the person off the rocks. With the tide rising and the casualties stranded on a rapidly shrinking reef, the crew prepare the XP boat, ready to launch it the moment they arrive. Every couple of minutes, the hail dynamic and the call out was changing regularly. <laughs> Again, basic sea survival, they tell you about in your boat as long as you can, eh? So if it happened to actually leave his boat, he was in a bad position. Even at a steady speed of 25 knots, it takes the crew just over 10 minutes to reach Rosehearty Harbour, with the tide steadily rising with each passing minute. Rosehearty Harbour, is, it's mostly a sandy beach right out next to the shore, but there's uh, a, sh a shelf of rocks and that was where uh, the casualty was. So as we came down by, we could actually see the casualty standing. He almost looked like he was walking in water initially. The boat was partly submerged and you seen the bow sticking up. So they knew that obviously the, the boat was gone. There was, there was nothing you could do with that as such. And the main focus was to get the casualty off the rocks. 
Life away, guys. Watch yourself. The position of the casualty on the reef makes it far too dangerous for the lifeboat to get close. So the crew launched the more manoeuvrable XP boat instead. It's ideal thing for going onto the rocks or onto the beach, uh, working in shallow water. Now you'll think right through there, eh? Aye, you'll go on that side, aye. With the tide still rising and the XP boat, the casualty's only hope of rescue, the crew moved towards him, constantly checking ahead for hidden rocks. Right, she's got a bit of shawl here. Keep her wide, Jess. When we first started approaching him, there was a lot of seaweed and uh, submerged rocks. So we really had to focus on what we was doing with ourselves first before we could even get to the casualty. You better go wider, she's getting shawl at here. But it was quite tricky in some places. Um, Try to get a clear passage through. Oh, you're sure I like can't hear, John. Keep her wide, keep her wide, keep her wide. They've made a big sweep through to the east, then come in eh, to the lee side of the rocks to avoid the, the broken water, which was a good decision. By avoiding the churned up water, the crew are able to see clearly and pick their way around the rocks as they make their way closer to the casualty. Right, when you go, Jess, we didn't get him. Right, just hold on, hold on, hold on. Right, wait like it off. He was just standing there, basically watching us coming in. I think he was a bit shaken up and uh, a bit cold. But in general, he, he, he sounded OK. As the casualty isn't wearing a life jacket and the tide is still rising, the lifeboat crew have to quickly put one on him before they can transfer him to the XP boat. That's all right. Right, you better hold on, get a jacket on. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on you. Come up here, I knew. I would say he was probably slightly underdressed for the conditions he was out in. He was soaking wet, but he was holding an iPad. And uh, it was, a, it was the only piece of item he had that was actually still dry. Put that on yourself. That's your iPad. He was shooking up, which is understandable. You're on your boat, it's floating, and a few minutes later, that boat's now sunk below your feet. You're in the water, scrambling with the rocks. A wave came and come back to the top engine. Got you. Right, who do I never started again. He said that uh, a lump of water had came over his engine and his engine cut out. And then, obviously, he just drifted down onto the rocks and uh, Start this sink, so he jumped off the boat into the rocks. Do you get in the middle? He's a bastard, AJ. Alright, we're doing. Well, it's alright, I'll shove you off once you're on. So we've got the life jacket onto him and uh, got him onto the XP boat. Right, go to your iPod. Right. And uh, pushed off the rocks and into the water and uh, we just never navigated our way back to the life boat. He was responsive quite well, and uh, I think he was just kind of glad that it was there, really, just to take him in, away from any danger. Right, up you come. As the casualty steps aboard the all-weather boat, Vic, the coxswain, recognises him as Ian, a well-known local fisherman. I was glad to see that he had knee injuries. He was tearing out the wheel hose, he was wrapped in blankets, made sure he had knee in their injuries, and then we notified the Coast Guard. With the casualty soaked through and feeling the cold, the crew decide that rather than make the longer journey back to the station, it will be better to rendezvous with the Coast Guard unit at nearby Rose Hearty Harbour. The tide was high enough for us to get access to the mother. Made sure the casualty was safe and well. Once he was happy, he managed to step ashore to the hands of the Coast Guard. Once safely ashore, the casualty Ian is assessed for hypothermia and left to reflect on a day of crab fishing, ruined by one rogue wave that swamped his boat and killed his engine. The tide and the wind, the, the, the same direction, was pushing me onto the rocks. And the water was coming over and over. So I jumped onto the rock because there was the only dry one there was. 
and the tide was coming in, you know, I phoned the Coast Guard. Telling them I was in a serious situation. Then the wife would come into the bay and pick me up. He was very happy to be in the Royal Island. Eh? He wasn't very happy with the outcome of his boat, obviously, but as well, again, you've got to look at it. You are safe. That boat can be replaced. You are safe. That's the main thing, eh? I don't know if he actually realises just how lucky he was. Again, if he'd been maybe slightly further off that rock, he'd probably spent more time in the water. If it wasn't for us getting him there, I mean, it could have been a whole different story. It could have been a body he was looking for, really. You just didn't know, really. Sweaty the life wood in the game. I didn't swim. Where could I be? Both in the boat and sea. Ah, I did a brown job. Well, I got my life saved. Back in Tlundudno, father and son kayakers Dave and Sam are hoping their beginner's bad luck is now behind them. It hasn't deterred us from going out at all. Um, so we replaced the kayak, got a new one, so we feel a bit more confident on that one. And um, yeah, when it's the right time, we'll be out, won't we? Definitely, yeah. Yeah. definitely. It's taught us a great deal. We're a bit more experienced. We'll have a bit more equipment with us, but the reality is anything can happen. I hope we won't need rescuing again. That's a one-time experience, I think. Yeah, that's done. Take that one off. <laughs> In Wick, Andrew is now very careful when taking photos of dramatic seascapes that he doesn't become the drama himself. Was put off for a few days, but then the following weekend, there were good weather conditions, so I went back out and thoroughly enjoyed myself again. I do have a double check just to make sure that the conditions are right. I check the tides, double check them. I've always respected the sea, but now I have a greater respect and realise that things can change very quickly. And in Plymouth, although Ashley is fit and well, he's still processing the emotions of having his boat sink from beneath him. Since the incident, I've been up and down like a yo-yo. Um, there have been times where I've cried myself to sleep, thinking, one, how stupid it was, and two, what I've lost, which to some people will sound daft, but I loved my boat. I was heartbroken to see it go down. The impact of the whole incident, really, um, has been my want to be at home a lot more. You don't realise how precious and short life can be until an incident like that, when you just realise you could have lost everything. Everyone makes mistakes in life, but that one could have been disastrous. It's definitely not one that I would want to relive again. Come on. I was ready with chest compressions, so I had my hands in the position. I was ready to go. Having in the bow, that's good. There is no hard shoulder out there. If the going is tough, you're going to be swimming. Dump your anchor, OK? Not only was the casualty becoming closer to the rocks, we were getting closer to the rocks as well. 